Righteousness and wickedness, two terms that seem to be cut and dry, but are they really? Is each person held to the exact same standard? It would seem that way, but maybe things aren't as black and white as they appear. Does that sound blasphemous? Then you might want to hang around and see what's in store in this week's 5 Minute Tour. Welcome back, Torah Tribe. You're watching the channel that connects disciples of Yeshua to the eternal Torah of God. It's great to have you back with us here today. This week's Torah portion is the portion of Ekev, Deuteronomy 7.12 through 11.25, and here are the three things that you need to know about it. Number one, passages related to food. First, we have the passage in Deuteronomy 8.3 that Yeshua quotes when being tempted by the adversary in the wilderness. Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Verse 3. This teaches us that the Torah is our spiritual food that will nourish us in times of need. Next, we have a list of the seven species of the land in verse 8. These include wheat, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, and date honey. Last, in verse 10, we have the commandment to give thanks for our food after we have eaten. It says, And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God. Although there's a tradition to give thanks before a meal instituted by the rabbis and popularized by Yeshua, the actual commandment is to give thanks after we've eaten, a difficult task for anyone not already in the habit of doing so. Number two, the summary of Torah. Most people consider the Torah to be a work of legalism, a list of do's and don'ts intended to be rigidly followed as a substitute for a loving relationship with the Creator. However, this week's Torah portion makes it extremely clear that this is not the case, saying that what God desires most from His children is for them to love Him and walk in His ways. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. This is chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. Number three, circumcision of the heart. As I just mentioned, God's greatest desire is that His children would have hearts that love Him and have a desire to walk in His ways. But until the day comes when the new covenant is fully in effect and our hearts naturally desire to serve Him, we are commanded to do the difficult work of training our hearts to submit to His authority. As our portion says, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. Chapter 10, verse 16. The Five Minute Torah is an indispensable resource that every disciple of Yeshua should proudly own. Within its pages lies a treasure trove of condensed wisdom, carefully curated to fit into the busy lives of modern seekers. With insightful and concise teachings, this book transforms the often daunting task of Torah study into an accessible and enriching experience. You can pick up your copy using the link in the description box below this video. Your purchases help support the continued development of new videos for this channel. Thank you in advance. This week's Torah commentary is called The Making of a New Man and comes from my book, 5 Minute Torah, Volume 2. As a reminder, the book of Deuteronomy is a largely a recap of the last 40 years of Israelite history just prior to the crossing over the Jordan in order to begin taking possession of the land. This week's Torah portion, like so many others, covers a multitude of subjects, although in the stream of one continuous monologue given by Moses to the children of Israel. Through this monologue, the Lord continually reminds the Israelites of their responsibility to uphold the conditions of the covenant He has charged them with. During this promise, he emphasizes the reason they are taking possession of the land he has promised them. Do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land, whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations the Lord your God is driving them out from before you, and that He may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. This is 
Deuteronomy 9, verses 4 and 5. In this passage, the Lord tells them that they are dispossessing the other nations currently living in the land of Canaan because of the wickedness of these nations. But what wickedness is he speaking of, and why does he contrast it with righteousness? Wickedness and righteousness are terms that are on the opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of legal responsibility. If a person is righteous, they are legally fulfilling their responsibility within an agreement, whereas a person is deemed wicked by failing to fulfill their end of an agreement. With this in mind, how does the Lord define the righteousness or the wickedness of the nations? What standard of righteousness are they held accountable to? As far as Israel is concerned, the Torah is explicit concerning their obligation to fulfill the commandments of the Torah. Last week, we discussed the fact that Israel's righteousness is defined according to the standard they were given at Mount Sinai. See Deuteronomy 6.25. These things have traditionally been enumerated as a total of 613 commandments, which include some of the most notable ones, such as keeping the Sabbath, the dietary laws, the wearing of ritual fringes, etc. But are the nations held to the same standard of righteousness that was given to Israel? Were the Canaanite nations being judged because they didn't keep the Sabbath or eat kosher or wear tzitzit? Well, if not, then what criteria did the Lord judge these nations that Israel was to dispossess? According to most authorities, the nations are judged by the standard given to Noah in Genesis 9 after coming off the ark. The laws derived from this chapter are called the Noahide laws. These laws are categorized into seven broad categories, which include six prohibitions and one obligation. They forbid denying God, blaspheming God, murder, sexual immorality, stealing, and eating the limb of a living animal. There's also the obligation of establishing a system of just courts. These are the basic laws by which those among the nations are judged. Well, this begs us to ask yet another question. What about those of us among the nations who have attached ourselves to Israel through accepting Yeshua as the Messiah? How will we be judged? Will we be held to the same standard as the nations or that of Israel? This is the question that the apostles wrestled with in Acts 15. They came to the conclusion that believers in Yeshua from among the nations seemed to be in a category somewhere between the two. They weren't simply Gentiles anymore, but yet they weren't Jews either. Therefore, they looked into the scriptures to find an answer to this situation and made the decision to put them into the same classification as the stranger who sojourns among Israel, giving them four prohibitions. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. This is Acts 15, 19, and 20. This is based on the directives of Leviticus 17, 8 through 18, 26 that spell out the obligations of the stranger who sojourns with Israel. Thus, through Yeshua, there is a creation of one new man that Paul speaks of in Ephesians 2, whereby the former Gentile receives a new identity in Messiah. He's no longer a Gentile, but neither has he become a Jew. He has, however, become something beautiful in the eyes of the Lord. He's become a new creation, as Paul taught the congregation at Corinth. If anyone is in Messiah, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This is 2 Corinthians 5.17. And although we will not be held to the exact standard as our Jewish brothers or sisters, the bar has been raised and we must work to realize the implications of such. I have a question for you that I would like for you to take seriously. What do you think are some of the new obligations of Gentiles who have attached themselves to Yeshua? And are there any new obligations, or should Gentiles be completely different than our Jewish brothers and sisters? I know everyone will have a different opinion, but I would love to hear yours. Just be sure to be respectful to those who may disagree with you, and I think we can have an excellent discussion on this topic. Tell me your opinion in the comments below this video. 
Well, thanks for joining me each week for these five minute Torah insights. Please help me to grow this channel by liking and sharing this video so that more people can experience great messianic teaching. I'll see you again soon with another messianic insight into the eternal Torah of God. Blessings from Amet HaTorah.